is to be able to gather together today as God's people to worship Him and uh, to, to celebrate our salvation and uh, to give Him the glory and honor that He alone is worthy of. This morning before uh, we begin our time of worship, let me just point out a, a couple of announcements to you. Uh, for the women that uh, gather for the uh, women's Bible study that typically meets the second Saturday of every month, uh, you will not meet in the month of June, um, but in July, that's when you all will uh, uh, commence your, your time together. And so no women's Bible study in June. Uh, look forward, uh, they look forward to coming back together uh, in July. And I uh, also wanted to make mention of uh, the uh, need for volunteers with regard to Operation uh, Reach Out Lunches. Um, we are in need of volunteers to help provide uh, these lunches. Um, there's information about this on a bulletin board uh, to my left, your right, right out of the, uh, the worship space here. Uh, you can see the information there and sign up to help, or you can talk to Allison Matthews, and uh, she'd be more than happy to give you more information uh, about that. Um, so those are our announcements for uh, today. I invite you to prepare your heart and your mind to, to worship the Lord. Uh, the Word of God calls us into the presence of God this morning, where the psalmist says in Psalm 34, verses 1 through 3, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, Magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt His name together. Father, we come before You this morning, and we ask that Your Holy Spirit would bring our hearts and our minds to a place of humility, that we would humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, and that today we would experience You exalting us up into Your presence so that there, as we behold you, we might magnify the Lord. We might exalt your name and that we might do it together as your blood bought people, redeemed by the blood of Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, would you move in this place in the hearts of your people that you might receive worship that you are worthy of. We pray you have your will among us. We ask all these things in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And together, God's people said, Amen. 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 Let's stand as we worship the Lord this morning.
Church uh, for uh, their accomplishments in uh, education uh, through their graduation. And so this year, um, we have two of those graduates who uh, are connected to our church, uh, and we want to honor them uh, today. One uh, that wasn't able to be with us here today, uh, Renee Lambert, who is the daughter of uh, Sharon Lambert, who recently joined uh, our church. Uh, she graduated from UNC Wilmington with a BS, a double major in business and Spanish. And uh, she's going to be moving to Lynchburg uh, soon to start the law school at Liberty uh, University. And so uh, we praise God for that. Uh, the other graduate that we have uh, with us today is Jibuso Ahim, and uh, he is graduating from Cuthbertson High School uh, this Tuesday, so in just a couple of days, and he will be attending Johnson C. Smith uh, University, and uh, he is the son of Anderson and Chinway, and uh, would you just put your hands together? And We'd like to give to you um, a men's study Bible that I'd like to present to you, and I uh, just want to say congratulations. To you. In any transition uh, in life, uh, I really have the same advice to everyone, and uh, that is Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, that say, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding, and I'll acknowledge Him in all your ways, and He will direct uh, your paths. A lot of times this time of year we, we hear people tell us that we need to be true to ourselves, uh, we need to believe in our hearts, and we need to follow our dreams, and in uh, reality what the Bible is teaching us uh, is to be true to God, and to be true to His Word, uh, to pursue His dreams for our lives, uh, and to follow Him. And so this morning, we certainly want to pray that, not just for those graduates that are connected to our church, but all graduates everywhere, and, uh, and we'll do that in prayer. The, the scriptures teach us that we are to, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And so as we do just that, would you, would you join your heart with me as we draw near to God's throne and receive mercy and help? grace him. Father, we do draw near right now as you have commanded us to do, and we do so by grace, Lord. Father, today we confess that we do not have it in and of ourselves to even lift a finger to do your will. God, we know that we are helpless, and Lord, apart from you, uh, we have no hope of eternal or spiritual life. And so, God, today we readily confess that to you. We, like sheep, have gone astray, each to our own way. But, God, today we are eternally grateful that the Good Shepherd has pursued us. The Chief Shepherd has come after us. And, Lord Jesus, you are that Shepherd. We thank you that you left heaven to come to this earth to pursue that which was lost to save us. God, today I pray that you would press it deep into our hearts and press it deep into our minds. The glorious reality that while we were still sinners, Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, laid down his life for us as a demonstration of the love of God. Jesus, we praise you today for the forgiveness of our sins, a right relationship with God, restoration of our souls, and Lord, a clear path for us to walk as given to us in your word. And Father, today we receive your forgiveness through the blood of your Son. And today, God, we pray that you would help all of us, whether we are graduates or not, whether we are pursuing a career, trying to parent, trying to live a single life, whether we are children, whether we are in the later stages of life, no matter who we are and where we're from and where we're going, I pray, Lord, that we would be anchored to your word that, God, your word would guide us in all things, 
that it would be the meditation of our heart day and night. We pray, Lord, that as we hold fast to your word, that you would spur us on to joyful, faithful, loving obedience to you, our King. And God, that we would live no longer for ourselves, but for him who for our sake died and rose again. And that, Lord, we would live to accomplish the mission that you've given us to make disciples of all nations beginning right here in Weddington and extending all the way to the ends of the earth. God, today we thank you that the great shepherd of the sheep has rescued those of us here who have trusted in Christ. And Lord, I pray today that you would help us to continue worshiping you, not just here in this hour, but in every moment of every day. We give you glory and honor, and we do so in the strong name of Jesus. And together, God's people said, Amen. 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 Let's stand once again.
or as Paul is going to tell Titus, the office of overseer or elder. So Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9, and as always, if you found your place there, you're probably God's Word, I invite you, if you're able, to stand with me in reverence for the reading of God's Holy Word. This is the Apostle Paul. He's writing uh, to his young protege in the faith, uh, an apostolic delegate who has a pastoral responsibility in this place called Crete. He writes to Titus about how the church ought to be conducting itself in a similar way he wrote to Timothy. We begin in Titus chapter 1, beginning in verse 5, where the Word of God says, This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and his children are faithful and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination, for an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach, he must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine, and also to rebuke those who contradict it. And this is the trustworthy word of our Lord. Would you pray with me? Oh God, we thank you for this word. It is our very life. Jesus, you quoted the scripture when you said in the face of temptation that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. I pray, Lord, today that we would have such a hunger for your word that we would realize that your word is more important to our existence than what we are going to eat for lunch today. We pray, Lord God, that as we have that hunger by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would fulfill it. God, today, that you would instruct us as to what a church ought to be, especially what its leaders ought to be, indeed must be. We pray for anyone here that has not come to faith in Christ yet. We pray today, Lord, that you would speak deeply into their heart, that they may know their need for the great shepherd, Jesus Christ, who was wounded for their transgressions. We pray today would be the day of salvation. Move now in the way that I can't move. Show us things that none of us can discover on our own. We pray for transformation into the image of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, and again together God's people say, Amen. 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 You can be seated. I don't know about you, but I think I can speak for everyone when I say this, that I don't like awkward moments. Uh, anybody like just go looking for awkward moments? I, I don't like awkward moments. Um, I'm talking about those moments where you're put in a situation where, oh, it just is cringeworthy and you wish you weren't there, right? It's like when you think you see somebody you know and you wave and then it's not them and then you don't know what to do after that, right? Or uh, you see somebody coming and, and uh, you open the door uh, too early and you force them to run to the door and they feel like they have to do it. It's an awkward situation. I remember a few years ago, I was in my hometown of Mount Airy and I went into a gas station and I uh, see this man uh, who looks like my friend Keith that I hadn't seen in so many years. And, and I said, man, i got to get over there to Keith, you know. And so I run up there, and, and he's got his back to me. And I, I run up, and I put my hands on his shoulders, and I say, hey, Keith, how's it going? And I turn him around, and it's not Keith, you know. It's just an awkward situation. I don't live for those kinds of moments, right? And I don't think you do either. And maybe today... You have that feeling like I did with who I thought my friend uh, Keith was. Maybe you think as we're about to dive into this passage here that this is about to be a very awkward moment. 
And what do I mean by that? Well, maybe you think, I mean, why do we need to hear a sermon about what a pastor ought to be? I mean, is the pastor going to preach a sermon to himself and then everybody's going to listen in as he preaches to himself? <laughs> that would be an awkward moment. Maybe that's what you're thinking this morning, that this is going to be a, an unnecessary sermon that we really don't need. Maybe, Pastor, you can think about this, preach it to yourself if you'd like to, but we need something for us that's applicable to us, which inevitably raises the question, why, why a sermon on pastoral leadership? Why a sermon on the godly leaders that God is looking for in His church? Well, there are a number of reasons. The overarching reason is this, that a healthy church needs holy leaders. A healthy church needs holy leaders. Over the last several years, I have witnessed, and maybe you have as well, within our own convention of churches, the Southern Baptist Convention, I have witnessed, maybe you have witnessed, what I would call a crisis in leadership. And the crisis in leadership finds its root in a crisis of character. Men who I thought were godly men above reproach, some of whom I even looked up to as models of Christ's likeness, worthy of emulation. And yet, over the last several years within Southern Baptist life, we have seen many high-profile church leaders fall into sin, disqualify themselves from serving as pastors, and thereby stain their life and ministries, and brought unimaginable pain to their families, their churches, and their communities. Just a couple of years ago, uh, the pastor of the largest Southern Baptist church in South Carolina uh, was removed from the office of pastor because over a period of several months he had developed an alcoholism that disqualified him. It was a crisis in character. And just a couple of weeks ago, it was revealed that one of the most influential SBC pastors and leaders in the last 30 years had credible, corroborated allegations against him of immorality and even abuse. Just two days ago, I read of another high-profile Christian leader having fallen into immorality. It is safe to say that we are experiencing a crisis of leadership, which is rooted in a crisis of character in leadership. Some people think, and maybe this is you today, some people think that pastors like myself are some kind of super Christians who are above temptation to sin. But I want you to know that the harsh reality is that we are not. In fact, I believe that pastors have an even larger target placed on our backs by the enemy because he knows that if he can take a pastor down, that he can take a flock down. So why do we need this sermon that speaks to us about who a pastor is to be and what a pastor is to do. Well, number one, it will remind me of who I'm called to be and what I'm called to do as your pastor. Number two, it will remind us as a church how we are to hold pastors accountable, what we are responsible to do and what we are responsible to be. Number three, it will bring clarity to any man in this church who aspires to one day become a pastor as to what qualifications must be present in his life. Number four, it will help everyone here today know how to pray for me, your pastor. And fifth and finally, because pastors are really just those who lead by example, and the character requirements found here in this passage are to be present in every believer. This sermon will help us all know what it means to be a faithful follower of Jesus. This will not be an awkward sermon. This is a necessary sermon. This sermon here today is from Titus chapter 1 verses 5 through 9. Where we find that Paul taught Titus 
to appoint overseers or elders in Crete who were above reproach and held fast to the word of God. The truth for all time that I believe God is teaching us today is that overseers or elders or as we often call them pastors should be men of Christ-like character possessing biblical conviction and demonstrating preaching and teaching competency. What I want God to do today in the preaching of this passage of Scripture is to help all of us understand the description and the qualifications for the office of overseer, elder, or pastor so that we as a church will raise up, affirm, and hold accountable leaders who meet these qualifications. And speaking of qualifications, what are the qualifications for those who aspire to the office of pastor? There are four here in this passage. They are not exhaustive, but they are what we find in this passage. And it's very simple to remember. Four C's. Calling, character, conviction, and competency. He must be called of God. He must have a Christ-like character. He must have conviction in the scriptures, and he must have a competency to teach and preach those scriptures. In other words, a pastor or overseer or elder is called to lead the flock in character, to feed the flock in conviction, and to guide and guard the flock with competency. Today we begin there in verse 5 where we see the first of these qualifications where we read Paul telling young Titus these words. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Here, one of the first points of instruction that Paul wants Timothy to know about is about what kind of leaders ought to be leading the churches there in Crete where Titus is ministering. And the first and only office actually that Paul tells Titus about is the office of pastor. We know from 1 Timothy that there is a second office that we call the office of deacon. But I believe the reason that Paul tells Titus here only about the office of elder, overseer, or pastor is because the churches there were still young and it tells us that if there's going to be an office of leadership, it's going to have to be pastors. At this point, deacons were not something that Paul was concerned about in, this, in these churches. What he wanted to make sure of was that there were qualified men of God to lead, feed, guide, and guard the flock of God. The term that we see here in verse 5 is elders. But the other term that we see down in verse 7 is uh, the term overseer. These two words here are different words, but they refer to the same office. An elder is uh, typically seen as an older man, but when it applies to the office that Paul is speaking of here, it doesn't refer to uh, uh, chronological age. It refers to those who are mature enough in the faith uh, to be able to lead God's people. That's an elder. An overseer is one who is a guardian over God's people who exercises oversight. But the other word that we see for this office in Scripture is actually the least used, even though it's the one we use the most, and it's the word pastor. And the word pastor simply means shepherd. And so the office that Paul is speaking of here is one. There are pastors in this category, and then overseers in that category, and then elders in that category. It's all referring to the same office of leadership. Sometimes they're referred to as pastors, very few times actually. Sometimes they're referred to as elders, quite a few times. And sometimes they are referred to as overseers, as we see here in this passage. If you want a place to see where all of these terms are referring to the same thing, you can go back and read Acts chapter 20, where the Apostle Paul speaks to the Ephesian elders, and he addresses them as elders, he addresses them as overseers, and he addresses them as those who have the responsibility to shepherd the flock of God. That's the first thing that we see about this office here, that it is made up of overseers or elders or pastors. 
The other thing that we need to see about those who are called to this office is a biblical pattern that we see beginning all the way back in the Old Testament and being developed into the New Testament. And that is the biblical pattern of what we would call a plurality of elders or a plurality of pastors. In other words, in the Bible, the way that God has designed leadership in the church is that it is to be a shared leadership. Uh, it is to be uh, made up of a team of qualified men uh, and none of the qualified men on that team is called to bear the full burden of the responsibility, but they share it together. You see this as early as Exodus chapter 18, where Moses is literally wearing himself out. He is, as the, the scriptures say, judging the people, that is, uh, taking their problems, that their disputes, they're coming to him, they're lining up, and from morning to evening, uh, he's deliberating and he's trying to shepherd them and teach them how they are supposed to function as the people of God. And what we find is he's doing that day and night and day and night, and then his father-in-law, Jethro, comes along, and he straight up tells him, this is not good, right? An in-law telling his son-in-law, this ain't good for you, right? And the reason it's not good is because you're going to wear yourself out. Here's what you need to do. You need to find qualified men, elders, who will be able to take care of the lesser cases, and then the more difficult cases they are to bring to you. And so certainly Moses is sort of a first among equals. He is a, a considered the, the leader that they look to, but his leadership was a shared leadership. When we get to the Gospels, we see Jesus doing this very thing. He doesn't just call one apostle, but how many does he call? He calls 12. But within that 12, there are three that are closer to him that have more responsibility, Peter, James, and John. And then within those three, there is one who we might say is a first among equals, who is Peter. He's representative of the whole body, but we see Jesus practicing this pattern of a plurality of leaders. And then when we get to Acts, the book of Acts, we see this fleshed out very clearly for us. That in Acts chapter 6, the apostles are ministering the word and uh, devoting themselves to prayer. There's a need that arises, and so they lead the church to appoint seven men who, as a plurality, will help them bear the load of the physical needs of the church so that they can tend to the spiritual needs of the church. And hence, we see the distinction between pastors and deacons. But everywhere we turn in the New Testament... There is never one occurrence, that's a bold claim, there is never one occurrence in all of the New Testament where a local church has one pastor with all the authority. In every church in the New Testament, we find a plurality of pastors who are serving and leading and feeding and guiding and guarding together. In fact, in Acts chapter 14, verse 23, we find that Paul and Barnabas, here it is, appointed elders in every church. With prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And so this office of leadership is referred to as overseer, elder, or pastor. And everywhere we look in the New Testament, following the pattern that we have in the Old Testament, there is a plurality of these men called to function as these leaders. But when we say they are called, what do we mean? Well, calling in Paul's day is a little bit different from the calling that we receive today. Paul has two young men, one named Timothy and the other named Titus. And these two young men, uh, contrary to what we may believe sometimes, they were not pastors per se like I, I am and, and other pastors of churches today. They were sent by Paul into two different places, Ephesus and then Crete. And they were given apostolic authority from Paul to carry out what he could not carry out because he wasn't there. And so there is a level of authority here that Paul has over Titus that's no longer existent today. Paul tells Titus that Titus is to go in to every town and Titus is to appoint elders. So the calling here came through Jesus' authority carried out through the Apostle Paul and delegated through Titus. Well, obviously today there are no apostles and there are no delegates of that authority. 
So how does one discern a calling to this office today? Well, one book back in 1 Timothy, we see sort of the development of how this calling is going to work as we move forward into the church age. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 says this, If anyone aspires to the office, two books back rather, if anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. What we find is that those who are going to occupy this office now in the New Testament, it is discerned by an inward desire that they have, an aspiration to occupy this office, that will then be affirmed by the church once they identify the observable qualifications in the one that's aspiring to this office. So this is the way it worked in my life. God saved me. And then almost immediately after God saved me, I had an undeniable thirst for the Word of God. For I said, the only thing I want to do is study the Bible and tell people about Jesus. That's all I find myself doing. I can't do what I used to want to do before I got saved. I can't, I can't pursue the, the aspirations that I had then. The only thing that I find myself doing is wanting to study the Bible and then make the Bible known to everyone else. That was a desire. It was an aspiration. And so I came to my, my pastor at the time. I said, this is, what, this is where my heart is. This is what I really want to do. And so he took me under his wing and he shepherded me and he discipled me. And he led me to get theological education and he made sure that character was developed in me so that they would then present me to the church to affirm me and ordain me. But it was only after I met the qualifications that we find here in this passage. And what are those qualifications? The first one is that inward calling. That God is moving us in this direction. It is affirmed by an inward desire and it is affirmed by the church. But the observable qualifications that the church must identify is there in verses 6 through 8. And it's character. Now it's very interesting here when Paul wants to teach us what it takes to be a pastor. He doesn't say, now you've got to have people skills. You've got to know how to fundraise. Man, you've got to know how to solve problems. You got, he doesn't even say you've got to be competent to teach and preach. He doesn't say any of that first. Now the first thing he says about men who are going to occupy this office is they must have Christ-like character. If you don't have Christ-like character, you don't belong in the office of leadership. Because the whole purpose of the office of leadership is giving people in your charge an example to follow. And if you're not exemplifying the Christ-like virtues here, then you have no business being in this office. And so Paul tells us, and he's doing that. He tells us the qualifications here, and he's guarding the flock while he does this. Because he doesn't want false teachers creeping in, men of corrupt heart, to come in and abuse the flock, to domineer over them and to not spare them. So he says that an elder or an overseer or pastor must have character to lead. And what is that character? Well, Paul says it twice. Once in verse 6 and once in verse 7. It's the overarching qualification that a man must be above reproach. Notice what he says in verse 6. If anyone is above reproach, again in verse 7, for an overseer as God's steward, that is one called by God and entrusted with this office of leadership, what must he be? He must be above reproach. And notice the emphasis there. He must be. This is not, maybe he will be, we'll put him in the office and because uh, we don't have anybody to fill it, and maybe he'll develop into that in the future. No, 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 no. These are observable qualifications that have to be met. They must be met. So what does it mean to be above reproach? Another word to translate this is blameless. It does not mean sinless, but it refers to one whose life has been changed by the gospel so they have no habitual pattern of sin that is worthy of blame in their lives. When they stumble into sin, it is an aberration. It's not a normal sin. They are marked by a life of repentance from sin. They are marked by a drawing near to Jesus. Though they are not sinless, they are striving to be like Jesus in every aspect of life. They are above reproach. 
But what does this blamelessness, this being above reproach, look like? Well, we might say it like this, as it refers to character. He must be above reproach in private and in public. First of all, he must be above reproach in private. That is, in the home. Notice what Paul says in verse 6. If anyone is above reproach, and this is how he defines being above reproach. The husband of one wife and his children are faithful and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. When Paul wants to identify a leader, this is where he goes. He goes into his home. How opposite it is today often of how we try to identify leaders. We try to say, well, can he preach good? Does he have administrative skills, right? Reminds me of a time a pastor uh, was, uh, he was a missionary that came back uh, stateside in the church that was looking for a pastor. They asked him to come and fill the pulpit one Sunday. He stands up and he preaches a, just an absolute grand slam sermon. And he comes down from the pulpit and the pastor search team runs up to him and, and they say, we're convinced you are our next pastor. And you know what he did? He rebuked them. <laughs> and he says, you don't know who I am. For all you know, I may be an abusive husband. For all you know, I may be a horrible father. You're going to call me to be your pastor because I got lucky, so to speak, and preached a good sermon? No, 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 no. Qualifications for the office of overseer begins in private. And it's not surprising that Paul would say here that the way, the, the, the place we see private character is in one's household. Because in the presence of your wife, and in the presence of your children, if you're married and if you have children, they see it all. Pastors can hide up to a certain point in public. They can't hide it at home. He says, a man must be the husband of one wife. Literally, a one woman man. That is, if he's married, the woman that he's married to must have his heart. His heart is not wandering from her. His eyes are not wandering from her. His feet are not scattering away from her to find love somewhere else. If he's married, the woman that he's married to has his covenant commitment. He's a one-woman man. He's the husband of one wife. And then Paul deals with his relationship with his children. If you have the ESV, it's a very unfortunate translation, one I do not agree with. The ESV says that the requirement here is that his children are believers. That is, I don't believe that's what this word in Greek means. Uh, Paul is not saying that if a man is married and has children, that all of their children have to be born again believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's the reason. Uh, even though I can train up my children in the way that they should go, even though I can bring up my children with discipline instruction of the Lord, even though I can live the gospel out and speak the gospel into their hearts, at the end of the day, I have no control over whether my child places his or her faith in Jesus Christ. I have no control over that. That is between them and God. He's not saying here that a, uh, an aspiring elder or pastor has to have children who are believers. Rather, he's using this word to refer to their character. That they must be faithful. That they must be uh, reliable. And what Paul is saying here is that the character of the father should be identified in the character of the children. Because the children look to the father for how to, li to, to live. And if the father is displaying Christ-like character, then it should be a given that in some way it's going to be replicated in the children. But the real reason that we know why Paul is not speaking about the eternal state of these children is because of how he defines it there in the next clause. And his children must be faithful and not, here it is, and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. In other words, as the Apostle Paul will say back in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and uh, verses 4 and 5, one who aspires to the office of overseer must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. And this is the question he raises. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? In other words, if you're not leading and managing in your own home to the point that your children respect your authority and follow your leadership, what makes you think people in the church are going to respect your authority and follow your leadership? That's the argument here. Now, it doesn't mean that if your children are 
are, are, are uh, debaucherous or are insubordinate to you, that, that there's no hope for you whatsoever. It just means that you've got some work to do. You've got some growing to do. Because you must meet these requirements. You must be above reproach in private, in the home. But next, the Apostle Paul goes beyond the home. And he tells us that we must be above reproach in private and public in the church and in the community. There are six negative character traits here that he says that we must not have. Uh, and there are six that he says that we must have. Rather, five that we must not have and six that we must have. We see this in verses 7 and 8. The negative character traits are there in verse 7. Let's just look at them very quickly together. He says there, an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. Here's what he must not be. He must not be arrogant. That is, he must not be a pride-filled man with only self-interest that domineers over others without any regard for their well-being. Number two, he must not be quick-tempered. And if a man is arrogant, then a quick temper is often birthed out of that arrogance. If he's pride-filled, he's usually quick to be angry. He's not to be quick-tempered. That is, a, he's not to have a short fuse. He's not to have a disposition of and a propensity toward outbursts of anger. He's not to be one who is easily offended or easily provoked. I like to say it like this, that if a man is to not be arrogant and he's to not be quick-tempered, it means that he's to have a tender heart and tough skin so that everything coming out of him is tender and gentle like Christ and then everything coming at him doesn't immediately get to his heart to make his anger meter tick through the roof. He must have a tender heart and a tough skin. Number three, he must not be a drunkard. That is, he's not to be given to intoxication of alcohol or the uncontrollable abuse of any substance that has the power to distort his judgment. Number four, he's to, not to be violent, either with his hands or with his tongue. Paul told Timothy this in 2 Timothy 2, verses 24 and 25, that the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. And fifth and finally, he's not to be greedy for gain. That is, he is not to be hungry for shameful profit, not hungry to make money at any cost, a man who hasn't lost his financial integrity. Pastors should be paid, Paul makes very clear in 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18. But pastors should not be in it for the income, but rather they should be in it for the outcome. These are the negative character traits that must not be observable in a man who aspires to the office of overseer. But verse 8 teaches us that there are positive character traits that must be there. There are six of them. One, he must be hospitable. Literally, this word means he must be a lover of strangers. He must be generous with his time, with his energy, and with his resources to meet the needs of others within the church and within the community. Number two, he's to be a lover of good. These are men that must be attracted to godliness. They gravitate toward virtue. Number three, he must be self-controlled. That is, he has control over and command of his mind. Number four, he must be upright. That is, he must be just and righteous, knowing and doing what is upright, reflecting the character and activity of our righteous God. Fifth, he must be holy, a different word from the common Greek word that we find for holiness in Scripture. This one meaning more to be to devout, devout to God and obedient to His will. And then sixth and finally, like the third one, self-controlled, he must be disciplined. He must be inwardly disciplined in thought and emotion. A discipline that leads to living holy, not just when others are looking, but because he knows that God is always looking. This is what matters most when it comes to the office of pastor. A man must have this character because if he's going to be leading and shepherding others, he must have a character that is worth imitating. But it's not just about character, as important as it is. But this character should lead to, should flow to the third requirement that we see here, and that is conviction. Conviction 
of God's Word, a biblical conviction. In other words, if a pastor is to be above reproach in private and in public, in verses 5 through 8, and Paul says here in verse 9 that he must be above reproach in the pulpit. He must have a biblical conviction, verse 9 teaches us. A conviction that will lead him to feed the flock of God which he purchased with his own blood. I remember when it comes to feeding the flock of God, what Jesus told Peter after Peter had denied him three times, after Jesus dies on the cross, is risen from the dead, Jesus pursues Peter, and he asks Peter, Peter, do you love me? In John 21. And three times Jesus says this, If you love me, you'll feed my lambs. If you love me, you'll tend my sheep. If you love me, you will feed my sheep. And what is he speaking about feeding them? How is he talking about tending to them? He's talking about giving them the Word of God. Verse 9, as Paul says, he must hold firm to the trustworthy Word as taught. This Word, he must hold firm. It means to cling tightly to. It means to ardently adhere to, to doggedly commit himself to, even stubbornly hold on to with a grip that no one can pry away from this word. Here's the thing. If we're talking about leading and feeding the people of God that Jesus bought with his own blood, the only way that the flock of Jesus is going to be fed is with this word. In other words, when I stand up here, I have nothing, I have nothing to say to you apart from what God has already said right here in this, this book. This means that men who aspire to the office of overseer are to be men of the book. They are to be men who love the Word of God. They are to be men who understand, as we prayed earlier, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. They must cling tightly to the book. They must hold firm, as Paul calls it here, the trustworthy word. Not just any word, but it is the word that is trustworthy. Understanding that the Bible, the word of God from Genesis to Revelation is true. It is inerrant. It is infallible. It is authoritative and it is sufficient for all aspects of life and godliness. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word, but not just any reading of the trustworthy word. He must hold firm to it as it has been taught. In other words, it's not just that he knows the Bible and knows the stories and knows the history. No, he must know how to interpret it. He must know not just what the Bible says, but he must know what the Bible is actually about. And the Bible is not just a collection of stories about stuff that happened in the past. Paul tells Timothy this in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, that the sacred writings are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. In other words, what's the Bible about? What are we to be teaching from the Bible? We're going to be teaching Jesus. We're to be lifting up Christ. We're to say that the Bible from beginning to end is all about not me and not you. It's all about Christ and Him crucified and risen. And it is able to make us wise for salvation through faith in Him. This is what Paul told Timothy and what doubtless he would have felt toward Titus as well. In 2 Timothy 2, 15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth, which leads us to the fourth and final qualification. And that is, not only should a pastor have character, not only should he have calling, not only should he have biblical conviction, but he must have a competency. That is, he must be able to do something, and that's what Paul says at the end of verse 9. Yes, he must have hold firm to the trustworthy word is tall, but for a particular reason, so that he may, here it is, be able to do, to be competent in two things. 
guide and guard, to give instruction in sound doctrine that is guide, and also to rebuke those who contradict it, who contradict it that is guard. The competency of a man of God who occupies the office of overseer is that he must be able to give instruction in sound doctrine. He must know the word to the point that he can guide God's people in the word. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 through 13 tell us that Jesus, when he ascended, he gave gifts to the church. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the shepherd teachers. There, there I am. For what reason? To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Here it is, listen to verse 13. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That is, that a pastor's responsibility in part is to help God's people grow. And the way they grow is through the careful and prayerful teaching and preaching of the Word of God, guiding them in sound doctrine. But then the last part of his competency here is not just to be able to guide, but to be able to guard. He is to be able to rebuke, to rebuke those who contradict sound doctrine. In that same passage there in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul goes on to say, after he says that a pastor's role is to help God's people until they all attain to the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, he says this in verse 14, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Friends, there are false teachers everywhere. There are people that are occupying pulpits at this very moment who are standing up and opening a Bible and they are speaking things that, that God never spoke. They are talking to God's people in ways that God never told them to talk. Just as it is today, it was in the first century. Notice the very next verses in verse 10. He says, for, here, let me tell you about these people who are contradicting sound doctrine. For there are many, he says, who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced, he says, verse 11, since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. Verse 12, one of the Cretans, a prophet of their own said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony, he says, is true regarding these false teachers. Therefore, Paul says to Titus, and tells Titus to appoint elders and to be able to do the same, therefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to false doctrine. You want to know one of the ways, if you are a man who thinks that you're thinking about aspiring to the office of overseer. One question that can help you discover whether God is calling you to do that is, are you bothered? Are you bothered by the way that false teachers are wrongly handling the Word of God? I'll tell you what's the stuff of nightmares for me. The stuff that keeps me up at night. It's that there are people who are occupying pulpits who are standing up and leading the people of God astray by teaching them what is contrary to what we have in the book. Teaching them that what their greatest need is, is advice about marriage, advice about parenting. Teaching them that their greatest need is to become prosperous and healthy and wealthy. The Bible teaches us that our greatest need is to find salvation in Jesus Christ that we might take refuge from the wrath of God. And it bothers me. It keeps me up at night. It wakes me up in the middle of the night that there are people occupying pulpits. There are people behind cameras on social media, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat that are butchering the Word of God. It compels me to say I must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught that I may be able to not just rebuke for the sake of rebuking, but rebuke for the sake of guarding the flock of God. Because I know the same stuff that I have access to 
on YouTube and podcasts and social media, you have access to that. And I know that at any given moment, Satan can slip his foot into your life and he can begin to lead you astray. What keeps me up at night? What keeps me on my face? What keeps me on my knees? And what keeps me driven is that God has called me to be a man of competency, to guide the people of God and to guard the people of God. So as we come to the end of this passage here, the obvious question is, well, what does this mean for us? Well, for those of you who are here today, and a lot of this just hasn't made a lot of sense to you because you don't really understand the salvation, you don't really understand the gospel, you just, maybe you're just here today because somebody told you to be here, and, and you just kind of found your way here. What you need to know is that you're not here by accident, and what you need today is not me as a shepherd, you need the chief shepherd. You need the good shepherd. You need the one that we sang to earlier. You need the one we prayed to earlier. You need the one I'm preaching about now. You need the one who, 1 Peter 2 says, humbled himself, bore our sins on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, we have been healed. We were strained like sheep but now by God's grace have returned to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. If that's you, you need to return to the shepherd. You need to turn from your sin and put your trust in Jesus Christ alone to save you from your sin and to save you from eternal death. But for most of us here this morning, we profess to be believers. Many of us here are members of this local church question for us is, in light of what the Bible has to say about this office of leadership, what must we do? Two things we must do. Number one, we must be constantly looking for and identifying men in our church who display these qualifications. And we need to identify them, and we need to develop them we need to affirm them, we need to ordain them, and we need to make sure that they are able to shepherd in our church and even be sent out from our church to fulfill the Great Commission, not only here, but to the ends of the earth. Number two, we need to begin moving toward establishing leadership in our church that lines up with the Bible, that is made up of a plurality of pastors, that is made up of a plurality of what he calls here elders and overseers. Our deacons and I have already been talking about this. What might this look like? What might this entail? What might this require? All of those questions need to be answered, but we know the why. This needs to happen. One, because it's biblical. Two, because no man, including myself, should have all authority in any church. Number three, because no man should have to bear the full weight of the burden of leading a church. Number four, because no man should go without accountability. You know, as we come full circle back to the way we began this sermon, it's certainly not been awkward. It's been necessary. And as I think about the necessity of hearing this, I cannot help but think of the crisis of leadership in so many churches, which is a crisis of character. And I cannot help but think that as I identify every one of these men that at one time were men of character, but who fell into grave sin, there's a marker that I see in almost every one of them. That is, they isolated themselves from other men who would hold them accountable. And they surrounded themselves with yes men who would not challenge them or correct them, but only validate them. And I believe God has given us the model for a plurality of elders that will share the burden of leadership in the church so that every one of them will be held accountable for their lives. 
so that I never get put in a situation where I isolate myself and make myself susceptible to sin, to fall into it. A healthy church needs holy leaders. One of the ways that we make sure that we are striving toward biblical health in a church is by identifying, raising up, developing, affirming, and ordaining men who meet these qualifications, who are called, who have character, who have biblical conviction, and have competency in the Scripture. That's my desire to do that. I hope that's your desire to do that. We need to take that desire, put it into words, and lift it up to God in prayer. So let's pray. Father, we stand before you as men and women, boys and girls, many of whom here have been born again of the Spirit of God, trusted in Christ, repented of our sin, freed from sin's power, freed from sin's penalty, but not freed from sin's presence. Lord, we know that we need to be shepherded not just by you, but, but by you through qualified men of character, qualified men of biblical convictions, qualified men of competency in handling your word. And Lord, your word teaches us that there must be, as the early apostles appointed in every church, a shared leadership, a plurality of pastors. I pray, Lord, for my own heart. And I, brothers and sisters, I encourage you to pray right now with me. Guard my heart, Father God. Guard my heart, Lord. Help me hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught. And help me, help me be above reproach when nobody else is looking. We pray, Lord, that you would raise up men in this church, men that I believe right now you are calling to this office of leadership. They know it because there is a desire, an aspiration in their heart. They, like me, Lord, have a burning desire to grow in their relationship with you, grow in their knowledge of your word, and grow in their competency to lead, feed, guide, and guard Pray you raise those men up. Make them identifiable to us. Help me to develop them. Surround me with them, Lord, for my own good, for your glory, and for the functioning and flourishing of your church against which the gates of hell will not prevail. Lord, as we respond to your word now, that is our prayer. Lord, we want to express it in song and also in more prayer. And so would you move and lead us, feed us, Guide us and guard us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me as we respond to the Lord?
time of worship today, a sobering time in, in God's presence, but I pray that today God will take His Word and press it into our hearts and uh, now launch us out to be on mission for Him. Griffin Templeton is going to come uh, and close us in a word of prayer. Receive this uh, benediction with you. Lord, bless us, keep us. Lord, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord, lift up his countenance upon you 